2018 has come and gone. It was dumb. Dumb and annoying. In all honesty, keeping up with so much of what's been happening in the gaming scene, or really pretty much all of pop culture, has been exhausting and tedious, if not outright depressing or infuriating. Sure, the whole Fallout 76 disaster was, and still is, fun to point and laugh at, as was EA's arrogance tanking their biggest title of the year, again, and I got a good laugh out of Soldier Boy making an ass of himself, Again? But shit like Telltale all of a sudden going belly up and leaving several people unemployed, Sony's arrogance when it came to crossplay with games like Fortnite, and the overworking of Red Dead Redemption 2's dev team were, uh, pretty shitty. But hey, it wasn't all bad. How's about we go into a more optimistic direction? Games that came out. We got some pretty good stuff. I wouldn't say that 2018 was as strong as 2017 was, but considering how many releases that year will most definitely go down as modern classics and some of the most acclaimed titles in the medium's history, it was gonna be a tough act to follow no matter what, and I feel like a lot of people probably expected that. Even still, 2018 had a lot of cool shit and I wanted to talk about some of it. I don't exactly have the material to make a top 10 like last year, but I'll work with what I got. None of these games are in any particular order, so I'm just gonna randomize them all. I've got more in my game library that I do plan on getting to, but I'm a busy bitch and I don't want this video to come out the same year that the Blade Runner sequel takes place in. We're staying in the first one, okay? Sorry that you're probably seeing this in February. Right, so let's deal with the obvious one real quick. Smash Ultimate. It's fucking awesome. Pick it up. If you own a Switch, you're pretty much legally obligated to get this game. Sorry, I don't make the rules. I didn't get into Dad of Boy quite as much as most other people, but fuck what I think. This game is so damn good. It's exactly what the franchise needed after Ascension showed how tired out the series formula was becoming, and every game after the first one showed that nobody writing the story had a clue what they were doing. The latest title in the franchise essentially acts as sort of a soft reboot where everything in past games is still canon, but not necessary to know to get the full experience. I'd say they made the right call doing that. So now the newest game and future follow-ups can distance themselves from that narrative dumpster fire and, in general, just do their own thing. Now, whether their own thing is staying strong even after the first game or becoming another dumpster fire, we have yet to see, but I'm interested to see where it goes. With Greece getting destroyed beyond repair and all the Olympic gods dead, Kratos now resides in Midgard, the land of the Nordic gods. He settled down, got married, had a kid, and then the mother died, thus making Boy a Disney protagonist. Dad of Boy is a lot more down-to-earth than previous God of War games. It's nowhere near as over-the-top or bombastic, but instead more relaxed and tender. Kratos as a character reflects this to a T, acting less like a psychotic and spoiled child throwing a tantrum where a bunch of people get murdered. Though you can still see some of his old, unhealthy mannerisms crop up from time to time. He's still the same character from previous games, just having recognized the error of his ways, and doing his best to prevent his son Atreus from going down the same destructive path he once did. The father-son dynamic is what the story and all its themes hinge on, and in execution, it's phenomenal. Throughout their journey, you can tell that Kratos does genuinely care for his son, but struggles to connect with him the way that he needs to, often leading to clashes between both parties and Kratos' teachings leading Boy to do some pretty concerning shit. The acting is spot on, especially in the case of Atreus where seeing him angry and barbaric is honestly kind of frightening. Like, seeing a kid angrily lash out and attack could have easily been the funniest shit on the planet, but no. It's done so well that it's legitimately horrifying to witness and think about how he'll turn out when growing up. The journey they go on is full with beautiful, exotic locations with a ton of really cool and at times terrifying creatures from Nordic mythology. It still feels like a God of War game, even if the approach is a heavy departure from series conventions. The level design is open-ended, allowing you the freedom to explore the world and do various side stuff, though being more contained like pre-Breath of the Wild 3D Zelda rather than full-on open world. It's nice to see a game do that for once, instead of another dime a dozen empty dirt box with a few towns spaced out by a hundred miles of grass. Maybe it can tell other companies that more contained level design is still alive and well, just like how it rubbed in EA's face the fact that single player games are still alive and well. 
Combat's also pretty sweet as to be expected. I was worried they'd find a way to simplify the already pretty simplistic brawler beat-em-up combat in the past games, but surprisingly the opposite happened. A lot's been added to make for a more versatile fighting system. Environmental damage, elemental weaknesses, attacking different parts of the body to either do more damage or trip up enemies, and I can't believe it took until Game 7 for God of War to have camera control and lock-on, but better late than never. There is room to improve on the game, armor and upgrades do jack shit, let's be real. But hey, for a first attempt at this style of game, let alone one that's this good, I really can't be hard on the game for that. I wouldn't call Dad of Boy my game of the year, but it fulfills on pretty much all fronts, and I've gotta applaud the game for that. Nice job making me not hate Kratos for once, Santa Monica. Y'all get gold stars. Keep it up. We currently live in an era that's heavily obsessed with nostalgia. Older classics are getting remade with those shiny new graphics. We've gotten systems like the NES Classic, Super Nintendo Classic, and Sony's botched abortion of a copycat. Even dumbass politicians are blaming video games for real-world violence again. It's like we never left the 20th century. Though, with a select few exceptions, obsession with nostalgia has never really been my thing. Mainly because I'm a 2000s kid, and I grew up when Nickelback, the Star Wars prequels, Out of Jimmy's Ass, and Soldier Boy shot into the water supply. So, I don't really have a whole lot to look back on with fond memories. But hey, if other people are happy, who am I to judge? One thing I do find awesome are a lot of new, original titles heavily tributed to old classics. It's a really precarious balancing act of keeping what still holds up while advancing and updating aspects that have aged like milk in the Sahara Desert. There have been duds for sure, but when they succeed, you get something fantastic, like The Messenger. Imagine 2D Ninja Gaiden, except it isn't harder than Dan Schneider in a room full of bare feet. That's kinda how I describe this game, but there's a lot more to it than just that. Obviously, the influence is right there. You play as a ninja, going through stage to stage, slicing and dicing enemies, platforming, killing a boss at the end, all that stuff. Though there are a number of unique mechanics that are included, such as the ability to fully climb up a wall as opposed to just latching on for a wall jump, and striking an object or enemy while airborne, allowing you to get an extra jump. They're taken great advantage of, and the level design really flourishes by having all these extra abilities to work off of. It's a challenging game, but by no means is it unfair. You still get punished for failing, but it's not gonna kick you back to the start of the game or anything like that. The whole game is a delight to the senses with the awesome sprite work, great animation, and one of the best chiptune OSTs ever composed. The thing that blew me away the most was when The Messenger pretty much became a completely different game. Starts off as a standard platformer, each level has its own different area that opens with a title screen, you go down a linear path to the end of the level, and repeat this gameplay loop multiple times. It's pretty alright, but then the game just decides to become a full-on Metroidvania, and my love is endless. Completely open-ended exploration, additional secrets unlocked, a whole plethora of new abilities, even completely new areas to explore and bosses to fight. It seriously kicks ass, especially with the past and future time travel mechanic. Time travel leads to some clever navigation-based puzzles that open some areas, block off others, and often have you think outside the box. Plus, the art style changes from NES to Super Nintendo-inspired sprite work depending on the time period, along with the music being remixed, and god damn it, this game is so fucking good! I'd seriously put it up there with Shovel Knight and Hat in Time as one of the brightest gems to come from the retro revival craze, using a template from the past and spinning it enough to make a truly standout original title. In other words, it's awesome. Pick it up. If you don't have any money, get some in a legal manner and then pick it up. Bet you never heard of this game until now. Or maybe you did, I don't know. Gris kinda came out at the tail end of 2018, and probably flew under most people's radars. Hell, I didn't even know the game existed until I saw Devolver Digital promoted on Twitter. I'm guessing it's time to educate all the people that are watching this video. All ten of you. Created by a Spanish indie team called Namada Studio, Gris is a 2D platformer that's short but oh so sweet. The game stars Fukuyama Gishi, who's wearing a black version of Igus's dress. You're standing on top of a statue, it crumbles to pieces just like my personal life, and all of the world's color disappears yet it still has more life and visual appeal than a Zack Snyder film. The main premise of the game is that you're restoring this barren wasteland to its once beautiful state by bringing back color. To first address the elephant in the room, Gris is very, very pretty. 
The game has a gorgeous watercolor aesthetic that manages to craft some jaw-dropping environments even when the color palette is deliberately minimal. You visit a harsh red desert, the lush green forest, and the dark depths of the ocean to meet and learn surprising facts about the magnificent animals that live there. The vibe I get from this game is that each environment is supposed to represent some kind of emotion. I'm gonna try to keep this all spoiler free, but from the way that every part of the game fits together, it's pretty apparent that the mood each environment conveys is supposed to represent the mental state of the titular character. There's a lot that suggests that she's going through depression or grief, likely from the death of a loved one. Now I'm not saying that for certain, as this is the type of game that feeds you the story strictly through what you see, as opposed to what's directly told to you. It leaves some room for the player to mentally fill in the gaps themselves, but still experience and feel exactly what the protagonist is going through. Honestly, after subjecting myself to The Quiet Man, which claimed to be up to audience interpretation and failed miserably at it, seeing Gris exceed at this as well as it did felt all the better. With how Gris actually plays, I can best describe it as the type of game that gradually builds upon itself. Just like how the colors you bring back sculpt new, diverse locations, the game constantly grants you new abilities that the main girl can pull off with her dress. You learn how to turn yourself into a heavy weight, glide, and swim like a manta ray just to list off a few things. They could have easily been forgotten in later parts of the game, but they're actually taken advantage of throughout the entire runtime from when they're introduced to the game's ending. Don't go into the game expecting much of a challenge. There's obstacles, but nothing that'll send you back or trigger a fail state or anything like that. Well, as far as I'm aware at least, I never died playing the game. If you want something that'll let you wind down and relax for a good couple hours, I'd say check this one out. Usually I wouldn't be all that thrilled about spending $15 on a game that's less than 4 hours long, but this is one hell of an exception to that rule. Oh, you bet your fucking ass I got hyped up for Spyro. After last year when Vicarious Visions and Activision gave us the Crash remakes, resulting in the latter company actually doing something pretty awesome for once, a Spyro remake in the same vein was all that I was asking for out of life. We got it in November, and now I'm left wondering what to even ask for anymore. Feels like everything's coming out in 2019. Avengers 4, DMC 5, Star Wars Episode 9, fuck, Kingdom Hearts 3's already out. What on earth could even happen after this year? I guess we'll figure it out when we get there, but I can say for sure that the wait for Spyro did not disappoint. There's a number of technical issues that other people have brought up that should be addressed, but hey, none of that stopped me from digging this collection. Just like Vicarious with Crash, Toys for Bob's efforts in recreating the entirety of the PS1 games from the ground up is quite impressive. They nailed everything from the game feel to the atmosphere and, of course, the environmental design. The controls in the Reignited trilogy I'd say feel better than the PS1 games ever did. Not to knock any of the originals, they're still some of my favorite 3D platformers to date in either version, but you can tell they're from a point when 3D analog movement was in its infancy and the remakes do feel a lot more natural by modern standards. With the graphical improvements, the Reignited trilogy I'd describe as looking just as good nowadays as I remembered the original versions looking all those years ago. It was pretty awesome going through all these levels I've been familiar with and looking at how gorgeous they are with the makeover. I got pretty thrown off when the ugly brown mess that was Beast Makers actually looked pleasing while still having the same level layout. Not to mention the animation and voice acting being much improved from when everybody looked like Muppets and sounded Romeo! Romeo! Wherefore art thou, Romeo? Fucking terrible. It's kind of insane how much detail they put into this remake. Every single dragon you rescue in the first game has individual designs and animations, and there's over 70 of them. Also, Ganasty Ganork has an awesome warlock design. He appears for one cutscene and a boss fight. Y'all didn't need to put so much into a nothing character, but since you did, gotta applaud it. I'm probably gonna always prefer the original soundtrack over the remaster, but the OST is still a damn fine reimagining, and even then you can switch back and forth between the two. Revisiting the games even allowed me to greater appreciate certain details I hadn't even thought about before, such as the first game's entirely non-linear structure and Ripto's rage having every two levels subtly connected together. I was a bit worried about how well Spyro was going to do in the same month that Fallout 76 and Battlefield 5 came out, but it turns out that both games apparently sucked really badly so Spyro did fine. Thanks AAA Gaming! I'd say overall the Insane Trilogy as a remake collection is marginally better than the Reignited trilogy, but both of them are worth checking out. If you've never played Spyro before, this is definitely the most
most convenient way to experience the original trilogy, even with its issues. So, uh, Spider-Man had a pretty eventful 2018. He took on Thanos, I didn't feel so good about seeing the end result though. Into the Spider-Verse came out, and of course, it was the best movie of the year. And we did get a turd in the wind with Venom, but at least that sucked in a way that you really can't get angry at. He's had it pretty big the past year, and it doesn't look like things are gonna slow down at all. Especially with 2019 having Far From Home and Avengers Endgame. He's coming back from the dead, let's not shit ourselves on that one. We also can't forget that he starred in one of the best licensed games ever made last year. Everybody went apeshit over this game when it came out. I can assure you that I am most definitely one of those people. I pretty much knew I was gonna love this game when it opened by skipping the hour-long tutorial bullshit that every modern video game ever has nowadays, and jumped right into the action with a showdown against Kingpin. And it only got better from there. The two things that Spider-Man does most often are swinging around New York and beating idiot bad guys up. Supposedly not to death, but... That's bullshit. The game does both of these things really well. Swinging around the overworld is so simple yet so exhilarating. It's one of those things when even if you're not actually doing anything in the game, swinging, jumping, and crawling all around this wide open sandbox is fun enough as is in its own right. I would say it's more fun than actually playing the game, Except it's not, because all the other stuff is so damn good as well. Spider-Man's combat system really caught me off guard. All the melee combos, various different web abilities, enemy variety, and emphasis on aerial fighting made for a system that's surprisingly really versatile. I did have my worries that they just do a cheap clone of the combat from the Arkham games, but no, Spider-Man went all out to make the combat its own thing. There's so much content in this game that even after beating the main story, I still stuck around for hours upon hours doing all the side stuff. I'm not even that big of a completionist most of the time, yet I stuck around to do everything I could because it was just so engaging. Even simple stuff like picking up Peter's endless collection of backpacks and grabbing snapshots of all of the landmarks. What caught me off guard the most, however, was just how goddamn good the story is. I expected it to be decent at best, but calling the story just decent feels kinda like an insult since it's hands down one of the best adaptations of the Spider-Man mythos. It's refreshing to see the story take place at a later date where all of the backstory stuff for most of the characters has already happened. Seeing Peter balance his adult life and Spider-Man persona as opposed to still being a high school student, MJ actually being useful and awesome for once, Jameson becoming one of those angry talk show lunatics that rave about chemicals making frogs gay, it's awesome to see all these familiar characters start off at this point. It's quite the eventful story. Acting as a starting point for this new take on Spider-Man, introducing several different characters, establishing relationships with one another, having everybody develop and grow for better or worse, not to mention the various different subplots and setup for future games. It could have easily been a disaster, but they nailed it. My favorite part is watching Peter interact with everybody because it's just so wholesome. The acting from everybody is what really makes it all work as well as it does. Special mention going to Yuri Lowenthal's portrayal of Spider-Cop. His Spider-Man is the best version of the character we've ever had across any medium and I will die on that hill. Embodying the awkward dorkiness of Peter Parker and the heroic wisecracking attitude of Spider-Man flawlessly. That ending though, it made me cry. I'm not even joking, this game is just so palpable. The game's got problems like the shitty stealth, but with how strong everything else in the game is, it's hard to be bothered by the shortcomings. I'm really looking forward to seeing what they do from here. After this game, I know for sure that this franchise is in good hands. At the beginning, I said that none of these games were in any particular order. That is still the case, but if they were, Celeste would definitely take the top spot. No contest. I originally picked it up on the Switch's eShop thinking, okay, this looks like a fun and cute platformer, I'll give it a shot. Then it became one of my favorite games of all time. I'm not even exaggerating, it's in my top 5. It's hard to find a place to even start talking about this title, but I guess since it's a video game, I'll go over the game part. Celeste is a 2D platformer where your ultimate goal is to reach the top of this giant ass mountain. It's a pretty simple game to pick up and play. Jumping, climbing, and dashing are pretty much all that the main mechanics consist of. Despite not being the most mechanically complex, the stages do wonders at utilizing your small moveset. Getting through every challenge the game tosses your way is just as much figure 
figuring out a puzzle as it is platforming, knowing when to use your dash ability for extra height or distance, and how long you'll be able to latch onto a wall before getting exhausted and sliding off. Every stage that you go to has its own unique mechanic that adds a whole new layer of depth to how everything is structured. Celeste may only have a few central mechanics to work with, but that doesn't really matter with how much the game still accomplishes with that in mind. There's a fair bit of trial and error, and you will die. A lot. It's a pretty challenging game, but it's by no means the frustrating, unforgiving kind of hard. The control is perfect, and even if you do fuck up on a challenge, the game just sends you back to the start of the screen. No game over, no lives lost, just try again. The game does a damn fine job easing you into the more difficult parts that lie ahead, introducing you to a mechanic and gradually challenging you more and more so that you'll have mastered it by the time that the game calls for you to get out of your comfort zone. The base game is relatively short, but there's so many extra challenges and optional items to collect that I stuck with it long after I beat the main story. The game is comprised of a sprite-based art style. Instead of the art style trying to replicate the feel of 8 or 16-bit games from the past, it feels like a stylistic choice unique to the game alone. It looks and feels like it was specifically tailor-made for Celeste exclusively, it just happened to be pixel art. And well done pixel art at that. The game is vibrant and beautiful, with every location having a lot of detail and every chapter having its own distinguishable aesthetic choice. I could look at any out-of-context screenshot of the game and perfectly guess what level it's from. Then there's the story, and I adore it to fucking pieces, just like the rest of the game. The whole theme revolves around the main character Madeline and her struggle with anxiety as she makes her way up the mountain. The game holds no punches back. Every stage you visit in some way reflects what the protagonist is suffering through. It feels like the mountain is essentially shaping itself into Madeline's mental state. It might not be the most subtle way to get the theme across, but hey, nothing wrong with being direct about it either. Having dealt with a ton of anxiety and stress-related shit throughout a good chunk of my life, Celeste really hit home with me. Experiencing what Madeline goes through in the game is both terrifying and hard to watch, but seeing how she inevitably overcomes it all is uplifting and kind of inspiring in a way. I've played plenty of games that excel in both story and gameplay, but I can't name very many that manage to seamlessly integrate both together as well as Celeste does. The game is a masterpiece and I can't recommend it enough. It's my favorite 2D platformer ever made, my favorite indie game ever made, and easily my favorite game from 2018.